Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is Rod Hembry here. And I'm Janice. And Quick Study Television is the program you're watching right now as we take you through the Bible in one year. This is very exciting. Today we are still in 1 Samuel. Corey is here to help us. What are you doing, Corey? Today we are going to be taking a look at En Gedi. En Gedi, fascinating. You know, I love this En Gedi stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, you, you have something here. You've done a letter, another yes, letter. Yes, I do. Another letter this week, and it's from Doreen. Part of the letter and, and a question that she has asked. All right, Doreen, we, well, it, it, she's asked you a question, right? Not going to be me. I'm not going to tell till the end. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, we'll we'll check that out later. Uh, we'll give it maybe to Ryan. Ryan, what's up? Well, today we're taking a journey to the Nazca Desert. Here lies giant, mysterious lines and shapes. How are they constructed, and what was their purpose? All right. Very good. And later in the teaching segment, Ziklag was taken. What does David do? We'll talk about. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, we're told that David and his men were hiding out in the wilderness around En Gedi. Uh, and we have this uh, rather humorous, it wouldn't have been humorous at the time, but now looking back on it, rather humorous uh, exchange between Saul and David, where David has the opportunity to prove to Saul that he spared his life. But let's focus in on this place. The name En Gedi means spring of the goat and is the name of Israel's largest oasis. Located on the western shore of the Dead Sea, this oasis has four perennial springs and so has always been prime territory for cultivation and the home of much wildlife. Located along cliff faces, En Gedi is also home to thousands of visible and hidden caves, many of which are still being explored and likely house ancient treasures. The first mention of En Gedi in the Bible is found in the book of Joshua, where En Gedi is listed as in the territory of Judah. Excavations at En Gedi, however, have revealed an older than Judah temple on a cliff overlooking the Dead Sea. Its use is a mystery because of the lack of any written history. The temple was not destroyed, but rather abandoned, possibly due to invasion or threat. Bronze ceremonial artifacts dating to the biblical time period just after the flood of Noah, the time the temple was in use, were found in a cave a few miles away, articulating the very early advancement in metallurgy. En Gedi was also the famous hideout of King David as he was being hunted by Saul. A place of lush vegetation, plenty of water, and a notoriously confusing system of thousands of caves to hide in, En Gedi was the perfect natural fortress. Perhaps one day, an unexplored cave high up in a cliff face will yield remnants of David's campgrounds. During the days of Solomon, the Bible refers to the vineyards at En Gedi, and many other historic documentation speak of fruit, perfume, and leather production. In the days of the Split Kingdom, the kings of Judah built up the city of En Gedi as a royal economic center, testified to by royal seal impressions. Between the 1st century BC and the 1st century AD, the city of En Gedi was caught up in the Great Jewish Revolt of 66 AD and the Second Jewish Revolt, leaving the city worse for the wear, although it did enjoy a resurgence between the 2nd to 6th centuries AD, leaving behind now famous Jewish synagogues. Now, Israel today is so full of history. I mean, it has been uh, occupied continuously since the, the, since the time period of the Old Testament, and it has been uh, built and rebuilt upon. So pretty much anywhere that archaeologists dig or survey in Israel, they are, they are still finding things. Now, often, uh, even just with uh, topographical surveys that are on the surface, archaeologists are finding new things. But, but more often than not, they have to continue to dig down 
below uh, modern builds to get to the levels. And Getty is, is kind of the exception here. It is so wild and so rugged a place. It's beautiful. It's a national park today. But much of the area uh, that is a part of this national park is so rugged uh, that it's still, as you can see from the segment, it's still uh, being uh, discovered today by, by people who are exploring or going rock climbing. I mean, can you imagine being the person who's going rock climbing and stumbling in on that cave that hasn't uh, had a living soul in it for two thousand years. Uh, just amazing stuff. Uh, and it's just uh, one example of what a job biblical archaeologists have uh, when they approach the land of Israel. So um, I'm going to keep uh, on top of all the discoveries that are happening. There are more and more discoveries every day and every year. And I'm going to try to keep you posted. You know, we give up when the trouble is too intense. We just, we just pack it in. We say, it's just not worth my effort. Just as David and his men did in this time in history. They gave up, convinced that they would never be welcomed back ever into Israel. And so they defected to the Philistines. The anointed king was servant to the enemies of Israel. But God knew the future. David would emerge from his depression and return to Israel to take the anointed position that, that he was prepared for. There are times, too, when, when we give up. We are human, and it is hard to see God's work in our lives. But God is working. First Samuel 27, verses 1 through 12. And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish some day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. And Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. Then David arose and went over with the six hundred men who were with him to Achish the son of Maok, king of Gath. So David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, each man with his household, and David with his two wives Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath so he sought him no more. Then David said to Achish, If I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. And David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For those nations were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as you go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. Whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. And Achish would say, Where have you made a raid today? And David would say, Against the southern area of Judah, or against the southern area of the Jeremielites, or against the southern area of the Kenites. David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform on us, saying, Thus David did. And thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. 
So Achish believed David, saying, He has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. 1 Samuel chapter 27, verses 1 through 12. Boy, I'll tell you, it continues. You know, just when you think it's messy enough, it gets even more messy. And that is the question that we ask ourselves today. How could this be? How could it possibly be? But it's true. And uh, we see this in reading the scripture that you've just seen. Janice has read it for you. But do you have your Bible guide? Because we're going to get the Bible guide out and you're going to read it. It's going to be excellent. Because I want to encourage you, if you don't have the Bible guide to write for yours, send an offering in any amount. That'll keep the electricity going and the cameras on and all the men here and all the women here and we'll be working for the Lord. And so when you do that, it's important. Use the American, Canadian, or the British address. And you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com and click on Donate when it comes to the Bible guide. Now, this is important. When we talk of works of faith, I'm talking about the things that work. Now, this is true. I, I, I don't know how to say this except leaving Israel. They were leaving Israel. Who was leaving Israel? David was leaving Israel. That's messy. That is really bad. We read 1 Samuel 24 to 27. We keep up in the Bible when we go through there, looking at 1 Samuel 27, 1 through 12, because David does something and he kind of gives up on everything and he starts to walk away from God. Well, that's absolutely true, beloved. That's what happens. Now, 1 Samuel 27, verses 1 to 4. Listen to the word of God. And David said in his heart, in his heart, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. That's what David said. You get a chance to hear what David was thinking. David said in his heart, I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me then I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. And Saul will despair of me to seek me anymore, any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. And then David arose and he went over with the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Makok, the king of Gath. And so David dwelt with Achish at Gath. And he and his men, each man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinonom the Jezreelitess and Abigail the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. It seems like it's true. It seems like God is doing that. David gave up, defecting to Israel's enemies, the Philistines. Saul gave up his search for David and actually minded his own business. But here's what we have to remember. <laughs> God was not finished with David. And I can tell you there are many stories of individuals that I can say, I just gave, they said to me, I just gave up on God and I said, forget it, I'm going to go do my own thing. And you know what? God rescues them. <laughs> Every single time. The one who knows who they are and what their heart is, is Jesus Christ. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. He recognizes and he goes after them. That's exactly what happened to David. Because it's not over. I mean, we go from this to a king of Israel. Okay, watch this. 1 Samuel 27, verses 5 to 7 says, Then David said to Achish, If I have now found favor in your eyes... Let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines, listen now, was one full year and four years months. This is a long time if you ask me. David was given the city of Ziklag. God knew the significance of this city, beloved. God is sovereign. He rules over all and works even when our faith is weak. We consider our faith, David considered his faith gone. 
Because remember that David was anointed by Samuel as king of Israel. And he said, why should I bother? I'll just leave Israel. I'll just go over there because then he won't seek me anymore. Then I'll just spend the rest of my life over there and so be it. But you see, God was working on David. And you know, God does with us too. There may be people who are watching the television program, watching the internet, listening to the radio right now. I want to tell you something. The truth is that you may have given up on God and said, forget it. I will not ever go back. But I want to encourage you that the Lord Jesus Christ is stronger than anything that is against you. If you submit yourself to the working of Jesus Christ, and if you make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, beloved, then this is just a setback. God will establish you. God will continue to make you grow. I want to tell you, I know that from personal experience a couple of times in my life, so you need to keep that in mind. Now we go to 8 to 12. And David and his men went up to and raided the Gershonites and the Gerizites and the Amalekites, for those nations were the inhabitants of the land from old or of old, as you go to shore, even as far as the land of Egypt. Whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man or woman alive, but he took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and he returned and he came to Achish. And then Achish would say to him, where have you made your raid today? And David would say, against the southern area of Judah, or against the southern area of the Jemalites, or against the southern area of the Kenites, David would save neither man or woman alive to bring good news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform us or inform on us, saying, thus David did. And thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So Achish believed David, saying, he has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant, look at this word, forever. Now that's fascinating because we come to this. David is fulfilling his calling. You say, what is he doing? Rod, how is he fulfilling his calling? Even in the company of Israel's enemies. You see, God never lets us waste our time. You see, those, those particular people, were individuals who would come against Judah and Israel, who would come against them. And David, as an enemy of Israel, so he thought, was actually attacking them and was actually doing the work that Saul should have been doing but wasn't. But David couldn't see that at the time because David felt that he was working for Achish, but actually he was working for the Lord. Now, beloved, I need you to understand that God is working with you. And if you feel like you're just doing the wrong thing all the time, but you've made Jesus Christ your Lord and you have asked him to come into your heart, but you feel somehow that you've been cheated out of things, let me tell you something, you haven't. You come to God and you say, Lord Jesus, I, I need to hear you. I need to understand you. So help me to have the patience and help me to hear you today. Next time on Quick Study Television, we continue still with the mess of Israel. Saul, David, the whole thing. It is very interesting. But right now, here's Ryan. Ryan? 
Today we journey to the Nazca Desert, where an ancient people have left giant and mysterious markings which can only be viewed fully from the sky. Now the big question is, if these markings are only visible from a bird's eye view, how did these ancient people, who were not supposed to possess the technology of flight, accomplish such a task? Known as one of the greatest mysteries of the past are the many unusual markings and designs which lie on the surface of the Nazca Desert, south of Lima, Peru. These markings, which include lines, geometric figures, and even animals, were really not properly identified until the 20th century, when the era of flight began. This is due to the simple fact that viewed at ground level, they are little more than grazes on the surface, made by scraping away thousands of tons of black volcanic pebbles to expose the desert's paler base of yellow sand and clay. The mystery of how exactly these designs were made, as well as their purpose, continues to elude researchers. Indeed, as one observes, the figures drawn on the desert are of various sizes, and some are quite large. A few of the straight lines, for example, run as much as five miles, and are perfectly straight. In fact, the lines are as straight as our best modern methods of aerial surveying could make them. On occasion, some of the lines will lead up to a small mountain or large mound, only to proceed again on the other side for a great distance. Another says, the task of transferring to a desert the figure of a bird or any other animal is one that cannot be carried out by a mere enthusiast. It demands rather complicated geometric methods, which alone can explain the extraordinary regularity and symmetry of the drawings, as well as the proper proportions among their elements. The fact that these designs are only visible from the sky leads some to speculate that these people had the ability of flight, though most would deem this completely out of the question. A growing many prefer instead to believe that the Nazca lines were actually landing strips for extraterrestrials. However, as one researcher boldly asserts, Nazca was not an ancient landing field, it was just the opposite. The lines, burn pits, and runways were once takeoff sites for a religion that worshipped the sun. Indeed, an examination of Nazca artifacts revealed that these people wove a very high-quality black cloth with a very fine weave, which appears to have been used for constructing hot air balloons. Apparently, in this culture, when a person died and thus was ready to return to the sun god, the body was placed in a basket attached to the hot air balloon. As the balloon and body rose up over the desert, the Nazcas claimed that the body was returning to be with the sun god. Because of the westerly directed winds, the balloon and body were blown out over the Pacific Ocean, where it would eventually crash, giving the body a burial at sea. It is significant that a demonstration flight was successfully made using principles and materials known to have been available to the ancient people of Nazca. So it appears that the Nazcan people, whoever they were, did have a form of flight technology in hot air balloons. This, of course, is not a widely accepted conclusion because it completely flies in the face of evolution, which assumes that ancient man was less evolved, less intelligent, and therefore less capable. Now, this is why appealing to extraterrestrial influence is so popular. But as one of the researchers said, Nazca was not an ancient landing field. It was just the opposite. The lines, burn pits, and runways were once takeoff sites for a religion that worshipped the sun. It also appears that at least some of the shapes in the Nazca Desert are astronomically aligned and were a part of their zodiac. Now, this doesn't point to evolution or extraterrestrials. No, this points to an intelligent but pagan people who had an unhealthy obsession with, this, with the heavens. Sound familiar? It should if you know your Bible. You know, it's really true, Ryan. A lot of people adjust their belief about the Bible into what they, what they think they know today. But you're right. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, two cavemen in the cave, ug and ug, no. speaking to each other, you know, ug and ug. It wasn't. It, they, they're sophisticated individuals. Yeah, absolutely. Corey, you look at cuneiform writing. Cuneiform writing is fascinating. It's it very sophisticated. Very complex. Very difficult to translate. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. We, and, you know, we don't really know. If we've translated all of it correctly, you know, now I'm going to get a bunch of people yeah. on my back. But anyway, but we we know that it's complicated writing. It's not simple writing. It's complicated writing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, anyway, 
That's very, very interesting. Well, Doreen's letter is not hard for me to interpret or to read. <laughs> and she's asked a question. Now, she's directed at you, Ryan, and we don't mm -hmm. normally answer questions on the program, but I thought this was good. I think she's referring to you because she's saying at the end, I believe all scripture is God-breathed and is without error, so therefore there has to be a logical explanation. And here, Dor Doreen from Thornbury, here was her question. I have a question. Uh, where did the Egyptians get the cattle, horses, and extra... Um, did they confiscate or steal them from the Israelites because animals were mentioned in further plagues and they had to have horses to pull their chariots when they pursued the children of Israel at the Red Sea? And the scripture she's referring to is Exodus 9 verse 6. So the Lord did this thing on the next day and all the livestock of Egypt died, but of the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. So it mm -hmm. seems that there might be a discrepancy because right. all of a sudden, uh, Pharaoh and his army had horses to pull their chariots to chase them at the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. So we had kind of talked about it a little bit earlier. Yeah. Question and to you guys. <laughs> what yeah. is it? Well, it's first of all, it's a great question. Uh, we were actually talking about it a little bit in the break, and I really mm -hmm. liked what Corey, I liked what you said. Um, and I agree with what you said. So why don't you tell them what you were telling me? Sure. All right. Um, okay. So there's a couple, there's a few different ways that you can take this. One of them is that when the Bible says that all of the Egyptian animals died, it may not mean all in the sense that we take that word in English. Uh, all means every single one. It may have just meant that the pestilence was widespread uh, over the Egyptian animals. Uh, also, we have to ask ourselves the question, was that all of Egypt from the north all the way to the south, lower Egypt to upper Egypt, or was the pestilence kind of centered in on the Nile Delta where the land of Goshen and the capital of Pharaoh was at that time? Was it just in that area? Uh, so those are some questions that we have to ask. Now, if we don't like any of those, another very uh, viable possibility, along the northern route of uh, going from Egypt to Canaan, along the Mediterranean Sea, there were several Egyptian fortresses built uh, that had troops and horses and chariots there. So they could have come down as well to pursue the Israelites. Hmm. Very good. That is excellent. And, uh, you know, and I like what Ryan said, they, or uh, both of you said, they use hyperbole, some of some hyperbole, what we call hyperbole in Exodus. Very, mm -hmm. very interesting. Well, you know, there's no hyperbole when it comes to God. Uh, God is real. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. And this God came 2,000 years ago. And he allowed himself to be crucified and killed. And he did so to pay the cost of sin. See, we're under sin. And sin is a problem. It is the enemy of God. But Jesus Christ can come into our lives and heal us from that sin and help us. And if you invite Jesus Christ into your life and say, Lord, be my Lord, forgive me of my sin, he will do so.